It's Andra Zaharia. And Dave Smythe. And this is the Cyber Empathy Podcast. By taking an empathetic approach to technology, we can create space for positive change and healthy relationships to grow. We share stories of kindness, curiosity, and connection that show how we can all shape online privacy and security. Thanks for being here. Maybe you've never thought about this, but cybersecurity gives us plenty of tools and opportunities to act out our values. What that means is that we have a chance to do things that are very much aligned with our moral compass, such as keeping things safe, being fair to others, protecting what's important to us and other people as well. When you look at how we use technology, cybersecurity actually helps us understand the consequences of our action. And something that I've noticed in this space is that people who resonate with the concepts of empathy, compassion, and kindness actually really behave according to their values and key principles. And they actually set an example that's really helpful for other people in the entire community. Emma offers the clarity, kindness, and nuance that we need to just proceed with more caution and with more generosity and curiosity in our work as cybersecurity specialists. It's very interesting how she highlights certain situations that remain hidden for most people, but that actually represent key lessons for just improving how we do cybersecurity awareness, how we talk to people, and how we build relationships in the industry and, of course, outside of it as well. I'm absolutely delighted for you to listen to this episode and to meet Emma and just soak in all that she has to offer. Emma, I am absolutely delighted to have you on the Cyber Empathy Podcast, to have the opportunity to talk to you about all of the ways in which you're helping people improve their relationship to cybersecurity in general and improve their lives as a result. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. To dive right in, I wanted to ask, you are at the forefront of all of these opportunities to get people to feel good about themselves when they interact with any sort of, you know, cybersecurity technology or experiences. How do you try to make cybersecurity specialists aware that that is such an opportunity, that it is an opportunity to just create a positive experience for people? That's a really good question. There's so many different ways you can use. I think instinctively, I always head towards creating a personal connection. And I think when you find someone who is is not sort of experiencing the positivity in cybersecurity and is maybe tempted to sort of start framing others in a more negative way, why did that user over there do that? Why? Why did they push that button? Why did they click that fish? I think the first thing to do is to try and empathize with them and what's got them to that position where they're feeling this amount of kind of frustration and desperation almost, I think, sometimes. Because the one thing I see in security is that it's it's not a case of, you know, the good guys and the bad guys or anything like that. It's a bunch of people who are nearly all doing our best with the skills that we have and the perspectives that we bring and the, our, our position in organizations or within families or, you know, wherever we are. Nearly everyone is trying to do their best and trying to do the right things. And so I think when you see someone who's gone uh, some way down a path of negativity, the main thing is to understand why they are there and to try and empathize with with why they are there. Often, I think it's sort of bitter experience, you know, <laughs> people don't pull these views out of nowhere. They have more for many, many years behind them of trying to trying to do things, trying to do things right and to help other people do things right. But to be frustrated, I think that others don't share their perspective and their skills. And then I think once you've made the connection with them and let them know that you have seen them, you know, you understand them and you completely get why it's hard because you've been there as well. Then you can start trying to bring in alternate perspectives and try to encourage people to, again, to see the world from the perspective of the person that they are talking to or talking about. As an example with phishing, it's so easy sometimes to look at sort of a test phishing email and go, that's really obvious. Why on earth would anybody ever click on that? Well, it's obvious to you partly because you know it's a fish. The person who was on the receiving end, by definition, does not know. <laughs> they are in the middle of a busy inbox with, with tons and tons of emails there, most of which they need to click on. 
many of which they have attachments that they need to open, many of which are not expected because that's how email works. That's how life works. Some of which will have spelling and grammar errors and all the things that we traditionally tell people to look out for. And I think when you start sort of trying to put yourself in the position of that person there, it's easier to go, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, actually, my expectation isn't reasonable. And my my expectation that everyone should find it as easy to spot phishing emails as I do, then that's not going to work. I think the other thing is to encourage self-awareness. Even as a, an alleged cybersecurity professional, I know how often I use weaker passwords than I should. And, you know, it, it does happen. I know that I write passwords down sometimes insecurely. It happens. I know that I reuse passwords sometimes, always in allegedly a sensible risk managed way, allegedly, according to what I think at the time. But one thing research shows us is that cybersecurity professionals are actually worse for this sort of behavior because, you know, they have a certain grasp of the risk and just sort of enough to make it feel that it's okay for them to break the rules. You know what I mean? So, but I think this is, and that's fine. And it's probably not something that we're going to change very quickly, but it's just something to be conscious of. You know, if we find cybersecurity too difficult, if we find it too difficult to manage passwords the way that we know we should, well, how on earth would we expect everybody else to magically do it perfectly when we cannot do it ourselves? And I think just being honest with ourselves about that kind of gets us a long way. So I try to notice all the times, like I say, I, I, I manage a password in a slightly suboptimal way, or I skip an update because I go, oh, God, I just don't want to do that now, even though I know I should do it now. Yeah, I always will get around to it later. I always will. But uh, I think just being conscious of those things and the thought processes that we go through and it, the fact that those those are the same things as the, the other people experience, because we're all people at the end of the day, you know, newsflash, but we're all people and we all experience these kind of frustrations and difficulties. And again, I think just encouraging that self-awareness and that honesty is a great thing. It helps remind us that, that we're all in the same boat to some extent. Those are such powerful examples. Thank you so, so much for that. I feel like the way that you talk about compassion and self-compassion, and it always starts with, with our own example and experiences. It's just like, for example, when you learn to give feedback, the first thing you learn or would help to learn is how to receive feedback. And when you learn how to receive it, then you know how to properly give feedback in a constructive way. This is the same thing when we pay attention to our experiences that starts to build that empathy muscle, starts to give us practical ways in which we can actually just create that, let's say, compassionate space for others to, to make mistakes, to be themselves, and also to be vulnerable, because this is a notion that is entirely demonized in cybersecurity for, let's say, good reason, because it's in the vocabulary. Vulnerabilities are bad. So people don't really feel comfortable when they feel vulnerable, when they feel like they don't know enough, they don't know how to behave, even, and I'm, I'm talking here about, let's say, both categories that we're discussing, both the people that we're trying to protect, but also cybersecurity specialists, when they feel like they're not managing to communicate clearly enough, they can't make that connection, they feel like they can't reach people in the way that they want to, that also puts them in a state of vulnerability. So. How do you think we could go about making personal vulnerability a good thing, a thing that actually helps connection? Because also research shows that vulnerability is actually the one thing that most helps people connect in a very genuine way. And it, it really helps with self-awareness and transformation. So how do you think we can get people to, to change their perspective a little bit in this industry around what it takes to be personally vulnerable? I think we need to uh, be talking about psychological safety a lot more. It's not a term that I hear terribly often at work, and I wish I heard it a lot more, because you're right, it's that sort of explicit permission to be vulnerable and deliberately going out and making yourself vulnerable that actually creates the space for you to build trust and for others to admit vulnerability and for you to kind of forge a bond where you say, okay, right, actually, you know, we're in this together and we can try to get out of it together. And partly that's what I'm doing when I admit to poor password behavior or the fact that I am ju it's just as possible that I will click on a phishing email as the next person is deliberately making that vulnerability happen and putting myself out there to let other people know that it's safe to admit their vulnerability as well. I do suspect this is a big part of kind of why we are where we are <laughs> in security is that it hasn't been safe to go like, actually, some of this stuff is a bit rubbish for everyone. Actually, there is no one who is invulnerable to phishing emails. 
there is nobody who can happily memorize 200 passwords. It's like a weird conspiracy of silence. And I think you're on the right lines with saying that it's about making space for us to be vulnerable and to be safer. As far as how you do this, how we make this conversation around cyber psychological security happen, as with so many places, we need to be bringing security more into line with how our wider organizations operate at work. Because in organizations, you know, when we're doing leadership and management development, you will hear talk about psychological safety. And leaders are encouraged to know about the importance of making psychologically safe spaces for their teams in order to help that team bond and to help it perform better. And I think it is just the case of kind of applying it to the security context as well to understand that psychological safety doesn't just help performance, but it helps us to be more secure by, again, creating that space for us to name problems and identify problems and admit vulnerabilities and then help get better. And I think it's similar with comms and security. You know, there are so many excellent comms professionals whose skills we are not taking full advantage of in security in terms of how we communicate threat information and how we give actionable advice to help people to deal with those threats. So often, I think, you know, all of the stuff is there. It's just a case of bringing it into security and using it well within that context. That's what we've historically been been rather bad at, I think, but which needs to change. It does. And I think we have such great premises now to support that change and to give it, let's say, momentum, simply because people from different disciplines are coming into cybersecurity and contributing their communication skills, their design, their UX skills. There are so many people coming in from, from the outside with less familiarity, familiarity bias, with fresh eyes, which I think is always such a helpful thing to have. Always. It, it never fails to show the real, let's say, the real experience of interacting with a cybersecurity product or experience or procedure or policy. And something that also came up to me while, while you were exactly pointing to how we can do this is that there's a powerful feeling, the feeling of camaraderie, the feeling of we're in this together. And this is something that is not, it, it's not something that I've seen very much being intentionally cultivated in companies. But even to me, for example, and I wanted to ask if this is true from your incredible experience, to me, even a cybersecurity incident could be an opportunity to build that camaraderie, to, to build that sense of we're going through this together, we're learning things together. And I was wondering if you've seen this from, from your practice and from your experience. I think so. Yeah, there's something about a sort of a shared incident that that nothing can really replicate in terms of, of team building and sort of really, I think, accelerating that process of uh, everyone learning to rely on one another in order to deliver and you know, save all of us and save all the people for whom we're working. Yeah, that's a really big thing. I mean, we see this in the industry. For example, I keep going back to, to WannaCry 2016, 2017, sorry, when the entire world kind of woke up to, to a new reality, the new reality of that was a tipping point for the industry as a whole, but also for, let's say, the public understanding of what cyber attacks can actually do. And obviously, it's it's been increasingly more difficult or challenging ever since. But I feel like this, these are some opportunities that we can find and leverage to create that positive association and to create that sense that we can rely on one another. Because I think that that's where that, that trust relationship really starts to, to blossom and to actually have very practical effects on, on every, everybody's work. So in terms of normalizing imperfection, normalizing that there's a lot of nuance in this industry where people want to put things into boxes and to declare them safe <laughs> or untouchable or accessible or whatever they are. We, we want clear labels, but we can't really always provide those labels. What kind of, let's say, abilities have you seen people exhibit when they're in a situation where they have to manage all of these, let's say, nuances and, and all of these tricky situations of internal politics and every other expectation that people have from, from cybersecurity specialists? Gosh, I think, I think it's really difficult, isn't it? <laughs> it's really, really hard when you're in an incident and you're up against the wall, and particularly if people are looking for you for leadership. That's, you know, personally a really, really challenging space to be. 
And a lot of that difficulty is down to the inherent complexity of cybersecurity and the complexity of any incident that you might face and the knowledge of how fast things can and do change. It's like you've always got to be prepared for what is around the corner, regardless of the fact you have no idea you know, what there may be. There's a lot of power, I think, in being the person who can simplify the narrative, who can take in all of the complexity or a lot of the complexity and still manage to cut through to, right, this is the situation, this is where we are, this is what we need to do next. If you can do that, then if people who think around you will immediately start feeling safer because there's a plan <laughs> and there's a lead. and the plan will change because plans always change. But the important thing is that you make people feel right. Okay, we, we have a direction. So. Then the next thing that brings to mind, and I think this is kind of difficult during an incident when everything is very pressured, but in a longer term way, it helps to try to build resilience in the organization by sort of letting people know that it's okay that we don't know what's around the corner always. I think a lot of sort of traditional approaches to leadership rely on leading from the front, being the person who knows where we are going and who's going to get us there. And that may have worked in the past, yeah, you know, to greater or lesser extents, but I don't think it works nearly so well now, again, because of the increasing complexity of cybersecurity and the threat environment and the general world in which we work. I think a lot of it is around helping more people to become comfortable with ambiguity and comfortable with the idea that we don't know where we're going, but we can still take sensible steps according to, you know, our assessment of the immediate risks in front of us, our assessment of the probabilities of what is going to happen a few days down the line and how we talk about those. And again, psychological safety is a huge part of that, I think, and about and equality, diversity and inclusion so that we have all of the right perspectives in the room and that we bring all and that we allow all of those perspectives to be heard. Because often it can be just one little voice in the corner going, guys, uh, am I the only person seeing this? And they may be the only person seeing that. And if they don't speak up about the fact about what they're seeing, then, you know, we're, we are less well off than we, than we were. I've seen leaders get really uncomfortable in the past at the idea that they cannot provide guidance to their team more than like a couple of steps ahead. And I think for them, it's like, look, really, really, it's OK. You know, no one else in the situation would be doing any better at foretelling the future unless they had an actual crystal ball. It is OK. And it is not your job to tell the future. It's your job to help your team get to the next step and then the next step and the next step in light of the emerging information that, we've, that we are finding out. That is a really, really powerful example, especially because it touches on the changing paradigm. We're, we're changing the story and the culture around leadership. It's, it's changing before our eyes. We can see it. We can see that there's no planning ahead. The environment is a lot less predictable than it was a decade ago. It's incomparable. And there's no perfect model to get through this. I think that we as humans obviously need a certain degree of certainty and we've gotten used to a society in which we can plan ahead a lot. Uh, I remember actually reading this a couple of weeks ago in terms of we have this, this let's say, expectation of predictability because we can plan our routes, because we have maps, because we know exactly where we're going, how long it's going to take to get there, how the weather's going to, what the weather's going to be like tomorrow, and all of these other things. So we expect to apply the same we, we just have the same expectation from other things in our lives, which are a lot more complex and a lot less predictable. So this changing story and this changing just culture, I think, is, is such a great influence because cybersecurity has so many great thinkers, people who are rebels, people who are incredibly creative, who this culture is rooted in challenging the rules and understanding how systems work, deconstructing them, putting them back together, improving them. So I feel like there's a lot, there are a lot of elements in cybersecurity who can just help people make even more of their innate abilities and, and the skills that they've built over time. And something that I wanted to touch on in this area is that alignment between your personal set of values and the work that you do in this field. Because from your example, I can see that you're the kind of person who is very much aligned with her work. You you act out your values. So I, wa I was wondering, you know, how things kind of evolved for you in your career that you ended up in this place where you can build on these values and use these values to to guide others and to help them do the same? Mm. Oh, that is an interesting question. 
I've had the same values, the same working values, I think, for probably my whole career. I've worked in public sector all my life because it's it's a very strong driver for me just to try and make the world a better place. <laughs> That's sort of the bottom line. That's the thing that gets me out of bed every day to, to keep doing the work that I do. And I've been lucky to have quite a varied career in public service where I think every single role I've ever done has met that sort of ultimate value or that ultimate need for me at work. I've been working in the exact field that I'm in, you know, in cybersecurity for about the last 10 years, I think. And that is by far the longest that I have ever stuck at anything in my life. I can't at the moment imagine wanting to move away from it, but, you know, never say never. It was, it was, things, things happen. And I think the reason here is that I'm able to bring a perspective in cybersecurity, which still isn't terribly common, which is more of that kind of naive user perspective, frankly. I came into my role with, which of course is a, a department stuffed with am- amazing technical experts. You know, I throw a stone from here, I hit 10 of them and um, are really wonderful people, generous with their time and skills and effort. But um, and they have technical skills that I will never, ever have. And to be honest, don't don't really want to have. They're not my thing. I don't get excited by these things. They do, and it's great that they do. And I'm really, really grateful for their expertise, but it's just not me and it's never going to be me. Partly, I say I bring that naive user perspective of, well, okay, so you, you're doing this very, very clever thing. It's got an audience over here who does not share your perspective. How do we make it work for that audience? And it's a question it's quite hard to ask in the abstract. But it's easier to have a better conversation on that, whether there is someone in front of you, i.e. me, who is representing that perspective and saying, look, I'm an expert in my field. I have a seat at this table, but the perspective that I bring is more along the lines of someone who doesn't understand a word that you just said. Make it make sense to me. Because <laughs> if you can make it make sense to me, then we have half a chance of making it make sense for the people out there. So I think it's kind of it's partly that. It's partly that sort of perspective of uh, that, that audience perspective, that customer perspective that experts always kind of need to keep hearing. Obviously, more advanced than that is the fact that I've done all of the reading and learning and research that I've done in the socio-technical areas of cybersecurity, particular kind of psychology and social sciences. I'm not an expert in any of these things, you know, by any means, but I have done enough around it to, to know what I'm talking about, basically, for the past 10 years. So it's never just my voice in the room. It always starts with, well, this is my perspective. This is how I see things, but I can back it up. I can say, actually, there is research over here that points in this direction. There is research there that shows that not everyone feels the the way I feel about this, but here is the range of ways that people feel. So here is the whole range of things that we need to consider, you know, when we're here. And honestly, I think that's that's kind of it. You know, that's my shtick. (laughs) That's what I've always done and what I really enjoy doing. And I think the other part of it is getting fired up sometimes on the basis of things that just aren't fair in cybersecurity. And again, I sort of mostly feel aggrieved on the part of the user, you know, the person who is is easily written off as the weakest link in ways that are completely unfair, written off because they don't have the supreme cybersecurity skills that the experts have written off because they don't come to work to do security. They just want to do their jobs. And, you know, you say this in a meeting and if people start shifting on their chairs, it's like almost an unsayable thing sometimes. <laughs> but you're like, well, no, come on. You know, we're talking about wanting people to put security first. Why would they put security first? What has security ever done for them from their perspective? And again, you know, you can ask these kind of challenging questions. You're like, oh, yeah, actually, this is the perspective that we need to think about. We need to think about selling security in ways that make it attractive, not just saying to people, well, you should care about security. And if you don't care about security enough to come into work every morning and spend an hour updating your device and refreshing all your passwords and you know, doing all the things, well, then you're a bad person when you do that, you know. It's, uh, yeah, that's how it has to be. I think it's, uh, like I say, it's so unfair that the ways that we sometimes treat people in security and the fact that we do fail to consider their needs and their perspectives and their capabilities. And then we tell them it's their fault. And I'm like, come on, I'm just not having that. I'm not having it. I'm here to make all of that better. <laughs> so in terms of values, you know, I think it's everything I just said, you know, wanting to make the world a better place, wanting to bring diverse perspectives into security where they are needed and wanting, you know, to stand up and, and give a voice to a set of people who don't often have the voice that they should when decisions are being made. So, you know, the user, for want of a better term, even though I'm not particularly fond of that term. I know what you mean. I try to find ways around it all the time as well. Thank you for sharing your story and thank you for pinpointing, let's say, those exactly those moments, those points of friction that still create a lot of resistance in between, well, cybersecurity specialists and the people that they serve. I feel like those particular areas, which 
it, which is exactly where you're bringing in your expertise and your perspective and you're getting cybersecurity specialists to, to build that empathy muscle to see and understand the bigger context around, again, their customers, sort of speaking. I feel like there's those points of friction are very tied to the stories that cybersecurity specialists tell about themselves and the identity that they're part of, the, the identity of the protector, the identity of, well, just the technical prowess. I think that that's another element that's part of the story. It's like a gatekeeper role sometimes, isn't it? And a, you know, a protector, the knight who is bravely protecting the castle and all the people inside. And it's a bit like that mentality sometimes, I find. Sorry, I totally interrupted you. No. No, 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 absolutely no problem. That's not, it's not bad at all, but it does create a distance. It does create a distance between them and the people that they serve, which serves no one in the end. It, it's, it, it's helpful for everyone. So I was wondering if we might be able to surface some of the elements of this identity that are, let's say, slowly kind of <laughs> fading away uh, because you have contact with so many great specialists from this industry who serve in so many different roles and they bring change into the organizations that they work with. They contribute to shaping the culture in those organizations. So I was wondering if you could provide some examples of what these people, let's say, look like and how they speak so that, you know, listeners can can really kind of picture and see these opportunities, which are at the end of the day, growth opportunities or that's for personal and professional development for them. This is such necessary work, you know, this work of bringing that more diverse per set of perspectives into cybersecurity. Like nearly always, cybersecurity is seen as this highly, highly technical profession. And in every meeting that I think I've ever been in, regardless of how technical it is, there's immediate acknowledgement that the difficult bit isn't the tech. <laughs> the difficult bit is the people work and the process work and the sort of the business work that goes around it. And I, I do think that gets lost. And I wonder quite why, because it's it's entirely well acknowledged I think, by, by everybody. In terms of kind of which kinds of diverse perspectives we bring in the room, which we rely on to succeed, well, it's pretty much everyone you can imagine. I think some of the people I've most enjoyed working with are the comms professionals from whom I have learned so, so much about how to connect with audiences and how to bring audience perspectives into, into the work. I think we talked earlier, I think, about the expert problem. And it's kind of, I think the expert problem can only be solved collaboratively. It is impossible to solve it by yourself. By definition, all, the only perspective you can ever bring to your work is your own perspective. I think working with the, the, the comms team and the user researchers that I've been able to work with here who have sort of amazing systems and processes and methods for bringing people, other diverse perspectives into the room and getting those perspectives considered in, well, in an appropriate way and a generous way and a kind and respectful way. And I think, again, I think that tone is perhaps one uh, one thing that I would pick out that is often different. It's never, oh, my God, that person over there did something that I don't understand. What's wrong with them? <laughs> it's always, oh, that person over there did something I did not understand and that I would not do. Oh, why did they do that? It's a tone of positive curiosity rather than frustration and distance. <laughs> And um, sort of coming back to this term, the user, I think um, I always fall into using it every so often, but I think we all do. But I don't like it because it's essentially othering. It creates division between us over here and those people over there. And that othering is kind of dehumanizing. It allows you to more easily write off that person over there for doing the thing that you don't understand or doing something in a way that you wouldn't have done it or even using a word that you would have used. So, yeah, I hate it. We need to be, you know, bring, bring more people into the tent, so to speak. Remember, we're all on the same side and we're around the same table. So, yeah, the comms professionals, the user researchers, and otherwise, I don't know quite how to say this, but it's the, the people who know how to get stuff done in organizations. The people who have the ability to work outside silos and to bring people together to achieve common goals. Um, in government, where I work at the moment, it's really, really complicated. <laughs> it's very complicated getting stuff done, bringing people together in that way, finding, you know, getting money to spend on the right projects and, you know, finding the right ways to spend that money and jumping through the hoops and the governance that you rightfully have to go to, go through in order to be able to spend public money. It's a whole set of skills in itself. And those people are just as much cybersecurity professionals as any of the more technical people or I am. I was standing awe of them on a daily basis because I know I couldn't do what they do. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't achieve any effect without the people that are here in these in more enabling roles who allow us to do that. I was just thinking about how fascinating it is to work 
in a government institution in cybersecurity where there's so much responsibility. I mean, not that there isn't the same level of responsibility in, in uh, private organizations, but it's even more because the expectations are even higher from governments who have to protect critical infrastructure, who have to uh, not only deal with legacy technology, but also make sure that they're at the forefront of both threats and state-sponsored attacks and all kinds of very, very difficult things that imply geopolitics and diplomacy and so many other things because cybersecurity is no longer a technical, well, it hasn't been for a while just a technical issue. It's a political issue. It's a geopolitical issue and has so many implications that it can be overwhelming for everyone. So I was wondering in, in this, let's say, space that has so much complexity, how do you practice self-empathy? How do you practice self-compassion? And what keeps you sane and healthy in environment that is that is so demanding because it is it is emotionally demanding intellectually demanding even physically demanding sometimes huge assumption there that i'm sane and healthy by the way <laughs> <laughs> is it i mean again it's difficult i've worked in a number of different kind of operational environments that work sort of different kind of things at stake some sometimes the most, the most extreme stakes and you're right it's terribly terribly hard to feel like you can ever put work down and walk away, even if at the expense of taking care of yourself. It's something I think we've got a lot better at over the years. And again, I think the role of leadership there has been really, really key. We focused a lot on bringing on leaders who think about who, no, that's perhaps not fair. I think leaders always thought about people first, but maybe they kept it to themselves a little bit. Now we have leaders who practice that care of their people, <laughs> you know, right out loud and at the most demanding moments. It's always been the case that during crises at work, you know, you will always see leaders walking the floors and walking around, just doing that management by walking about thing, checking on everyone, having conversations, picking up the mood, seeing if everyone is okay, and ordering in the pizza. You you know, the pizza is a huge part of the self-care. Again, I think it's around bringing in ideas from other realms that just aren't traditionally known about in cybersecurity, because we have to practice self-care in all areas of our lives. And like there's, there's recognized good ways to do that. And I think a lot of those good ways are just the same. It's about trying to keep your working hours reasonable, recognizing that if you work too long, even on the most crucial incident, you know, you're going to be getting much, much less effective every hour that passes and you need to be able to step away and you know, pass the button to someone else, go home and have a sleep. And again, there's the role of leadership there in structuring working environments and structuring team rotors and so on, you know, leading from the front and saying, you know, it really is OK to, to go home for a bit and, and look after yourself. Longer term or maybe sort of less pressured circumstances, the biggest sort of piece of self-care I do is to get out and talk to other people, really. <laughs> and this has, I think, become rather pronounced, you know, the past couple of years during the pandemic period, particularly when we were all mostly sort of stuck in our homes most of the time, um, running running the world over teams. It was very, very hard to get that same degree of connection. And we had to work quite, quite hard and quite explicitly on achieving connection. And these days, of course, we're doing a bit more hybrid working and I can choose largely where I work at home or at office. And so I make it a priority to come into the office at least once a week just to talk to people, literally to talk to people for no particular agenda, but just to kind of have a shared experience and shared concerns. And just, yeah, to be reminded that you're not the only person in the way in, in the world feeling the way you do at that particular moment. Sometimes have a bit of a moan together and be a bit negative and then go, laugh and go, oh, well, never mind, we carry on sort of thing. <laughs> Other times, I think more formally, it's about, yeah, recognising the frustrations and going, right, well, how do we move forward? What can we actually do here now? We talk in cybersecurity, we talk a lot about kind of encouraging self-efficacy and empowerment of people and not letting people sort of take on board threat information to the point where they feel paralyzed and, and you know, powerless to help themselves. And I think that applies to us as well. I think often, you know, the challenge is what can we ourselves do here now to, to make things better? What can we start to do? Even if, you know, we think the problem is those people over there, well, what can we start to do to make these things better? And again, that's, I think largely how you how you encourage people to feel happier about things is by reminding them that they do have a certain amount of control of their environment. It might feel quite limited, but whatever control you have, you can use it to the max, you know, and make sure you do. That's beautifully articulated. Plus that, again, that sense of there's someone else there who has my back. There's someone else there that I can 
trust on when there's someone there who I can talk to about the fact that this is too much for me, about the fact that I need just to slow down a little bit, that I need help, that whatever it is, it is that's I feel like there's a lot of yes, cultivating individual success and high growth path careers and relentless learning and certifications and there's an intensity to building your career in cybersecurity. But that comes at a huge cost. And we've seen, I mean, there are conversations on, on Twitter and in other, you know, places where the information security industry kind of congregates. We've seen people complain about burnout. We've seen people go through a lot of things. And obviously, this is not just specific to cybersecurity, but there is an added intensity and complexity to it. And being able to talk about this in public, to see that there are other ways, other approaches to building this path, to, to just taking your journey at your own pace and have periods where, yes, you can put in more work, but others where you rest more and normalizing that. I think that, again, this is one of the ways that we can contribute as an industry to the company culture. Again, just like you mentioned, leadership does make a huge, huge, huge difference. And something that I wanted to point out here is that I've seen leaders in cybersecurity companies that I work with who are both, well, I've seen CEOs and, and managers and leaders, not necessarily all of these roles at the same time. And I've seen people with a highly technical background who are more empathetic and closer and more supportive to their teams than other people who come from a more social background let's let's call it that so i think that this is a space where we can break down stereotypes that we should not walk in with assumptions but rather with that healthy curiosity that you mentioned earlier which is just so much more rewarding and just it eases the tension in the body in the mind and in the room as well <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Let's start off with the assumption that we're all on the same team and let's be interested and curious about what other people bring. Even when we see people doing stuff we don't understand, it doesn't make sense at first. Let's approach that again with empathy and curiosity because yeah, there must be some reason why they did the thing. If it doesn't make sense to us, all that means is we don't know what the reason is. We know we're not seeing that reason from where we're standing. So let's get over to where they're standing and see why they did it. Because I guarantee when you understand, you know, as they would explain it, it makes more sense. Absolutely. One of the questions that I, I recently saw in a talk uh, someone gave is that go and ask people, show me how you do it. Just show me how you do it. Walk me through it. And that's such a simple question that... It doesn't have to be, and these kind of questions really help when they're when you when you have them handy to go back in them and to kind of activate that. Like you lead the way, you show me how things look like for you in your own context, exactly where you're sitting, and I'll follow along and and try to learn from that. Exactly, yeah. And you ask people that, and you see them come alive because you've shown interest and you've shown that you respect what they do and you want to understand what they do. And you're coming at it from a position of, of, say, ignorance and curiosity, and you're relying on them to kind of lead you through this space. And again, I think some of the, the least successful security comms I think I've ever seen have come from that perspective of, well, we're security, and it's our job to tell you what to do. And it's your job to listen and do exactly as we say. I mean, where is the relationship there? Where is the trust? Where is the feeling seen, you know, <laughs> that there isn't any? If there's just an assumption that the people on the far end of your process, that it's their job just to uncritically put into practice whatever advice you choose to give them from maybe your central perspective where you don't understand the local context that they're working in, you don't understand the pressures that they're under, you don't understand all the minutiae and the complexity, the things that drive their daily decision making, then of course your comms are going to fail, of course. Admittedly, though, you know, on the flip side of that, comms, mass comms is a very hard challenge. <laughs> and of course, by definition, it's impossible to put out, you know, successful central comms that go across a very, very broad customer set that perfectly apply to everybody. You know, it's it's not really possible beyond the very, very highest level stuff. So it's a challenge, but you can do so much with the sort of the tone and the and the approach and the, and how you break things down for people. And I think how you seek feedback primarily, it's just understanding how your words land and then tweaking and changing slightly what you do next time in response to that. Occasionally seeing that almost like quoted as a source of weakness, like, well, why, why would we care what they, what they think? It's our job to tell them what to do, you know, with the authority. 
they need to listen to us. You know, we're supposed to have all the answers. And that's just another flavor of that kind of toxic or outdated leadership model I talked about earlier, where people think that because they're the leader, they should have all the answers. And if they don't have all the answers, then other people aren't going to have any faith in them. In fact, that's just not the way the world works anymore. Leadership jobs, I think, more than anything, is to show the way in general terms, to chat, to employ the frameworks, to show the behaviours, and otherwise to create a safe space for us to discuss things and explore things together and get to the right answer. It's more of a, almost a facilitation role, I think, than anything else. I was going to say this earlier when we were talking about kind of incident leadership. It's very easy and natural, I think, for leaders to devolve back to more directive leadership at those times. Because when you're feeling the pressure, you feel the need to be definite and directive. And it often works quite well short term because that's what people are expecting of you. And when people are feeling fearful and uncertain and they don't know what to do, it's great just to be told what to do. You know, <laughs> And you can go and do the thing and you haven't got to worry any further. So it can sort of work in a limited way short term. But I think all wise leaders will be very conscious of that dynamic and they will be maybe using it consciously, but aware that it needs to exist in that sort of wider context of, all right, well, we do what we have to do right now to put the fire out. But after that, you know, we're going to take a breath and come and do things a bit differently. When we're through the incident and when we're looking back at well, what caused the incident and even, you know, how did we deal with it? And was that the best, best, the best possible way? You were going to bring a different dynamic to that kind of leadership, you know, again, more curious and more open and more accepting and more willing to hear all the perspectives in the room rather than that fire is burning, we're going to just put it out. It's beautiful to know that there are so many and increasingly more people who practice this kind of leadership who really understand that, let's say, servant leadership model and, and manage to apply it. And I feel that new generation, well, generations that are coming now into the workplace, uh, Gen Z specifically, has the potential to, to reshape the culture in this sense because their expectations from leadership are exactly the ones that you described. They no longer just blindly and unequivocally accept what's what's thrown at them and they question everything they want to know why they are led by by their need for meaning and for different models i strongly believe that they're bringing on change that is irreversible and that they're going to really shake up the way that we do things and and kind of slowly push away these outdated models that stand in the way of change, in the way of getting meaningful work done, work that helps others and that help the people who do it as well. Because that's ideally where we want to <laughs> land in, especially when you're doing hard, complex, really challenging work day in and day out. You, you need those wins. You need that human connection to keep you going. It's fascinating times, yeah. I think it, it can feel a bit scary at times, that kind of working model that you describe. It can certainly be really, really disruptive and, you know, unsettling for people. I think there's, you know, the biggest trend I've seen is kind of an expectation that the workspace will be reshaped to suit the person who is asking. And I'm like, well, well, why not? Why can't I have things the way I want them? And other people sometimes can sort of look on and go, no, it's your job to fit into what is already happening. <laughs> and there's, uh, I think there has to be a tension between those perspectives, basically, because you're right, if people never come along and ask questions and demand for things to be different, then nothing will ever change in the ways that it needs to change. But equally, you know, this is a collective endeavor and we all have to find some way to work together that suits everybody. And I think there's a the notion of Chesterton's fence. Have you heard of Chesterton's fence? Uh, no, I haven't. Oh, I love it. I love it. I heard it from my friend Rob. And hey, Rob, and now I repeat it at every opportunity. So it's from the, the author G.K. Chesterton, who wrote that like sometimes if you're walking in the field or a forest or something, you may see a fence. Your tendency might be to think, well, I don't see why that fence is there. Therefore, I'm going to take it away. Chesterton's, the notion of Chesterton's fence is that you should never take away a fence that you don't see the need for until you've found out why it was put there in the first place. Because sometimes the fence will be very necessary. You just don't immediately see why it's necessary. <laughs> and so obviously the analogy is before you sort of change working practices or upend things to any significant degree, you do need to understand why they were first being done the way they are. It doesn't mean that change is wrong. It just means you can very, very easily put your foot in it, end up letting the bull out, you know, if you don't understand why exactly why that fence was there and why it's still there. That is absolutely true. The power of context will n probably never, never become less important in any conversation ever. And I think that context is, is let's say, the red thread that connected all of the key topics that we touched on today. And I, I really enjoyed this conversation. It's, it's given so many, let's say, so many 
insights to start with. So many, it opens so many drawers to many pathways to explore in terms of personal development and and just understanding how cybersecurity people work, what opportunities there are to contribute to again bringing in positive change, reshape the language, just strengthen those relationships and then create an atmosphere of trust. And again, shifting cybersecurity from something that is compelling and constrictive to something that is helpful, dependable, and um, just an ally for people. Yeah, and accessible, something that is not distant and scary and, you know, surrounded by gatekeepers who are using technical terms and terminology and systems and processes that you don't understand, but something that everyone should have a reasonable expectation of being able to understand and grip and use to do things that they want to do. Shouldn't be as scary as it is. It definitely shouldn't. And we're very lucky to have people like you leading the way and showing that this is possible and actually contributing to that change. That gives me so much hope and so much enthusiasm that the momentum of this conversation is is just rippling across the industry and beyond it as well, because I really need that. So thank you so much for, for sharing all of this and for being here and just for doing the work that you do. Cool. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to talk to you. And it's great to feel a part of, as you say, that wider community who is, is making change and helping to build great things for the future. Thanks for joining us. For show notes and links from this episode, head to cyberempathy.org, where you can also find resources to guide you to a healthier, more comfortable relationship with technology. And if you have a question for us, or if there's a topic you'd like us to discuss, we'd love to hear from you too.